symposium. Um, I'll take some notes while we're doing it. So if you see me typing, I'm just paying attention and thinking about um, questions that we could have. I wanted to um, also say a huge thank you to Jody Wang and to Aaron McKay for organizing us, keeping us on track, helping with the reviewers and everything, and obviously the reviewers and um, who looked at the abstracts and gave us feedback to select our program. Um, again, very much a lot of work and moving parts to do something like this virtually over several days. I wanna give a plug for Fridays. Um, Grand Round speaker, who is Dr. Zoe Cohen, um, the daughter of our beloved JJ Cohen. And um, she is actually an award-winning educator herself at the University of Arizona. So she's gonna be our speaker. With that, I'm gonna um, turn it over to you, Dr. Mag Magnuson, to share your um, presentation with us, addressing social and structural determinants of health. Oh, through, yes, through a community of learning cases. Thank you so much, Dr. Zimmer. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I say I'm also joined by one of uh, the co-authors on this, Jenny Rodriguez. So it's good to see you this morning, Jenny. And again, thank you all for giving us a platform to share kind of this new idea that we have. Um, so as we know, uh, social factors, including socioeconomic status, discrimination, and geography are leading determinants of health and strongly influence our clients' outcomes. These social determinants are further influenced by structural factors, including various educational, economic, and environmental policies uh, that shape our everyday lives. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because that might be helpful too. <laughs> I think I was getting some <laughs> eyes here. Sorry about that. <laughs> like this all sounds really fascinating. I would love to see it. <laughs> And so again, um, we know that these social determinants are further influenced by structural factors, including various educational, economic, and environmental policies that shape our everyday lives. And teaching physical therapy students about these social and structural determinants of health, as well as subsequent disparities, can be complicated by the somewhat disjointed presentation of social and structural constructs throughout our curriculum. Relatedly, students have reported reading and discussing existing cases within our program that either introduced racial, uh, ethnic, socioeconomic, or other health disparities without a deeper discussion of the factors underlying those differences, or they also encountered cases that may be uh, introduced or perpetuated negative stereotypes. Uh, many of our learning cases, our client stories, seem to end with a somewhat general and generic summary of differences and disparities according to more individual level characteristics, again, without that acknowledgement of the broader social and structural factors that really contribute to those differences. Uh, and presentation of cases in this sort of vacuum can seem to reinforce individual level explanations for poor outcomes while perpetuating those harmful stereotypes. As we sought to investigate these issues, we also discovered that many of our faculty were unsure how to go about introducing behavioral, social, and structural factors without them feeling kind of forced or artificial. Uh, many struggled with facilitating those deeper conversations regarding the interconnectedness of these factors and client outcomes within the context of stated learning objectives. So one product of conversations with students and faculty has been the formation of a case review work group comprised of students and faculty. And really the overarching goal of this group is the integration of behavioral, social, and structural determinants of health into our cases in a way that is more meaningful and that reflects our clients' lived experiences. We therefore came up sort of with this idea of a community tree, a series of interconnected cases that students will come to know over their time in our program. And the objectives of this community uh, tree are threefold. One, to address student concerns regarding biased case presentations and negative stereotypes. Two, facilitate rich conversations around the social and structural determinants of health. And three, understand our clients as diverse human beings whose lived experiences are unique and complex. We adopted the School of Medicine's guiding principles to avoid curricular bias to help ensure that our cases avoided stereotypes, encouraged exploration of language with regard to identity, and reflected various social and structural factors known to influence health. 
We additionally drew from uh, various frameworks listed here, uh, including the International uh, Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, the PT Client Management Model, Bronfenbrenner Socioecological Model, and the Anderson A Day Behavioral Model of Healthcare Use to help shape uh, and inform the inclusion of genetic, behavioral, social, structural, and other determinants of health. To start this process, we collected existing cases from our faculty and began to categorize content according to these conceptual frameworks and models. Uh, again, being sure to include the course number and associated learning objectives where possible. We then sought to identify gaps uh, focusing on those social and structural determinants relative to stated learning objectives. So for example, if the learning objective focused on goniometry or measuring joint angles, we weren't as concerned about the inclusion of those behavioral, social, or structural elements. If, however, the learning objectives focused on formulating a clinical impression or creating a plan of care, we then looked for the inclusion of various multiple determinants of health. Uh, we hosted a brief workshop to share our findings and invite faculty to consider opportunities for linking cases and learning objectives across our courses. Uh, and we've included a snapshot of, of just one example of a case here. So during students' first semester, they'll be introduced to a number of community members and asked to summarize key aspects of their social history and describe the relationship between individual, social, and structural determinants of health. During this first semester, they'll also be asked to demonstrate foundational skills, including goniometry. Uh, and while the client's social and structural history may not, may not be required to achieve that particular learning objective, we do feel that, you know, by being introduced to the cases, it will help reinforce the importance of seeing our patients as human beings first and body parts second. Uh, they'll then revisit this client again in their first musculoskeletal course, which takes place in the spring, and here they'll be asked to formulate a clinical impression of their client's newly developed back pain. To be successful, they'll need to consider again how those behaviors, social conditions, and structural factors might influence outcomes. This particular case culminates uh, in their last semester, summer three, where they'll be asked to co-create a plan of care that again integrates those social and structural determinants of health and reflects their clients' values, priorities, and preferences. We currently have six interconnected cases, members of this uh, community tree, who will be introduced to our incoming cohort this summer. Uh, we plan to assess the acceptability, usability, and feasibility of our community tree via student and faculty surveys and focus groups. And our hope is to grow this community tree to about 20 members over the next two years. And that's kind of the summary of our community tree. So I will go ahead and, and stop there. Great, thank you so much. This is really, I love seeing the interaction between um, you know, kind of building on different programs within the school. There's so many aspects of education on a health campus that I think should be integrated, like determinants of health, like structural racism, like leadership training, like communication and things like that. And so I'm always excited to see anything that takes us a step towards doing similar things within um, our model about how to approach our patients. How do you how do you preliminarily feel like students are responding um, you know to this it's a bit of a shift for them right it will be and um, yeah we've actually had some students who've been a part of our work group and really kind of have led a lot of these ideas um, and really were we're asking for, you know, just having a broader sense of, of clients' lives, um, you know, before they're doing this. They, they were getting that, but it was at the very end of our curriculum, and it just felt like, well, gosh, I wish we would have known about those social and structural factors at the very beginning. And so um, it was those conversations that really led us to kind of think about this community of cases, and they've been really instrumental in, in helping us to, to think about those cases, develop those cases, um, and then also as we've begun talking about these with additional students, they seem really excited because they're excited to see their learning cases as sort of real people <laughs> versus just, you know, singular learning objectives. So, so we're excited, and I, I think they're excited too. <laughs> awesome. Anticipating any pushback? Are you anticipating? You know, 
we've we've had some really good conversations with some faculty. I think a few, it's it's like any kind of diffusion of innovation, right? There are some that are early adopters and really excited. I think some, once they see how this is actually rolled out, they'll they'll understand, oh, I get it now. I think they're having a hard time conceptualizing and seeing how these could be integrated into their course or how their own cases could be integrated into this tree. So that's that's a little bit of I wouldn't even almost call it pushback, but a little friction that we're getting there. But again, I think once people can see it, then they'll be really accepting of it, I hope. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of some of our lessons learned around our health and society curriculum too. And then the last piece that I'll just say that I know is, is hard is how do you assess this? How do you assess students engaging with the determinants of health with structural racism? How do you figure out if they got it? There's no multiple choice question for that. And so I think it's pretty labor intensive to think about how to measure it. Um, I'm glad you don't let that uh, prevent you from doing it anyway. Um, we've sort of taken the similar approach and we'll you know, do trial and error and how to measure. So maybe we can collaborate on that. I would love that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And, and Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for joining us. Congratulations to your whole team um, on this project. Our next presenter um, is Dr. Roberto Silva. And uh, while you're pulling up your poster there, Roberto, it's uh, developing the Rural Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship at CU School of Medicine. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Zimmer, and thanks uh, to the rest of you for joining. It's nice to see everyone. Uh, for for those of you who, who I don't know, uh, I'm I'm the uh, assistant director of the rural program and director of, of the um, rural longitudinal integrated clerkship here at the School of Medicine. Uh, and uh, I'm, I wanna tell you a little bit about the development of this LIC and um, how, how it came to be and, and how it's different from development of, of some of the other LICs here on campus. So just a, a bit of background, uh, the rural track uh, was, was developed um, and uh, founded in 2005 by Dr. Mark Deutschman and uh, has graduated um, up about 200 uh, students at this point. Uh, it, it was started with the goal of getting um, more students to uh, start and stay in practice in, in rural Colorado. Uh, the rural track um, was the pioneer of integrated clerkships here at the School of Medicine and started uh, 12 to 16 week uh, clerkships uh, around the state. Um, when, when the announcement of the Trek curriculum um, was made, uh, we decided to expand the rural track into what's now the, the rural program. Included in that is a one year uh, longitudinal clerkship for the rural program students who will spend a full year in uh, rural Colorado, which um, uh, as you might guess, is, is uh, quite a bit different from the traditional uh, curriculum where students spend most of their time uh, at the uh, urban uh, academic health centers. So we, we sought to, uh, to do this and had a couple of objectives early on. First was figuring out what, what is required of a rural site to, to be able to host a, a full LIC. Um, we, we did that um, by planning and launching several pilot LICs around the state over the past few years. Um, our goals were to, to identify the, the, the right sites, the right preceptors and the right students for this. We also had the, the luxury of having a lot of time with our students in their first couple of years of medical school. So we, we worked a lot on preparing the students for, for the rural LIC. So, so what did we do um, early on? We looked at about 35 rural sites around the state and we approached them with the questions, how, how are we gonna determine whether they can host a full LIC? We looked at the makeup of the medical staff of the, um, of the sites, what is the scope of care at those sites? What is the volume of patients in their, in their clinics and hospitals? Uh, and, um, and what might be missing from, from those sites that the students are gonna need. So over the past uh, three years, we had uh, 15 pilot um, LICs at sites. These were six month LICs rather than, than uh, the full year. Um, and uh, in order to, um, uh, to study this, we took a lot of data from, from preceptors and from students. We had the students keep uh, very detailed logs of what they were doing. Um, the students 
um, logged every single patient encounter they had over that six months, which they didn't always like very much, but it gave us a, a great amount of information. They, they logged a few pieces of data about the patient, where they were, where they were seeing the patient, meaning in the, in the hospital or emergency department, with which preceptor they were seeing the patient and, and what was the specialty of that, of that preceptor. Um, after those pilots were completed, we have uh, determined that we have between 20 and 25 sites around the state that we, we feel are, um, are great sites for, for rural LICs. As far as what we found with those pilots, um, we found that all of the School of Medicine objectives uh, for the clerk for each clerkship was, was met at the, at the rural sites. Uh, the school also has lists of core conditions that they want all medical students to see during that year. We found that almost all of those core conditions were seen at our at our rural sites. So uh, we we really have made a few conclusions about this during our development. Um, the big one is that appropriately selected sites can support a full LIC. And I say appropriate select appropriately selected because uh, it takes, I think it takes a lot of work to, to determine that. A big finding that we have shown, but something we already knew is each site is unique. Um, as you can imagine, um, Steamboat Springs is very different from Ray and very different from uh, Cortez and Alamosa, et cetera. And each one of those sites is gonna require its you know, unique uh, monitoring and, and uh, development. Uh, something else that we, um, have found and shown is that rural preceptors tend to have a larger scope of care in terms of what they do. Uh, lots of our preceptors work in the hospital, also deliver primary care, work in the emergency department, deliver babies, et cetera. So, so one preceptor can, can uh, teach skills in multiple uh, disciplines. As far as our students, we've, we've uh, identified um, that students with rural backgrounds and or interest in rural practice are really the best suited um, for this experience. This is definitely not for any medical student. So a couple months back, we, we launched uh, an LIC with the hybrid class. This will be nearly a year uh, for those students. And just this week, we, we matched that first Trek LIC class to their sites. And so we're um, anxiously awaiting sending them off to their sites. So. Thanks. Congratulations, Roberto. This is amazing amount of work for you and the team. I think um, even though I hear about it, I underestimate how much um, effort it takes to individually choose these sites and explain what a longitudinally integrated clerkship looks like. And so thank you so much. And, and um, I'm, I think Jenny has her hand raised for a question. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Silva. And I think we might have met at another conference, um, another poster. And I think that my colleagues, Eric Sawyer and Joe Palmer may have met with you and or um, Dr. Deutschman, but um, thank you for this work and sorry for my ignorance, but um, is this launched in year three of the medical school curriculum then when everybody is out doing clerkships? So that's a, that's a great question because for, for the last, I don't know, hundred years, students did their, their core clinical year in the third year. Um, as you said, with the new curriculum at the School of Medicine, it's it's really um, essentially the, the entire second year of, of medical school. Okay, this got you. Thank you. So um, they're not taking courses from campus at the same time. It's, um, well, I, and I, this is probably beyond this, we can connect later, sure. um, I, but I'm very interested in hearing more. So thank you so much for your work. You're welcome. Yeah, I think one of the other questions I had, Robert, though, if you have but is the assessment, um, we, as you know, we are, and, and you stated we're moving towards not assessing every single clerkship from the same, some of them will be the same preceptor teaching a variety of different clerkships. And what does that look like in terms of um, grading overall? Yeah, it's uh, one, one of the challenges we, we may be asking one, one preceptor to provide, uh, you know, their, their evaluation or their, their narrative about students from, you know, uh, how, how is the student doing in the hospital? How did, how's the student doing in women's care? Um, 
with uh, children, et cetera. And that's, that's tough. Uh, that's a difficult thing for the preceptors to, to grab. Um, so we um, are doing a lot of faculty development in that area. Yeah, great. Nikasni, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? Yeah, I actually just had a comment. I just wanted to mention as a student who um, sort of matriculated through the rural track that it was easily the best experience of medical school for me. Um, and Dr. Silva was um, totally incremental in just making that happen for me. So I just wanted to thank you and just sort of echo that this LIC has been praised in and out of um, the academic setting for um, its development for students. So even just anecdotally, lots of my friends who have been through this clerkship loved it um, and gained a lot out of it. And I definitely wish I did it. So thanks for everything you do, Doug. Thanks for saying that. And it sure does look like I planted you in there to say that. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Picasso. Okay, Dr. Ryman, you are going to be next um, to share a screen there. Uh, with your poster abstract entitled an immersive critical care pilot curriculum for fourth year medical students. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for those of you who I don't know, uh, my name is Ann Ryman. I was one of the general pulmonary and critical care fellows um, here at the University of Colorado. I'm now the interventional pulmonary fellow. Um, and I've worked closely with um, one of the critical care faculty, Peter Huntress, um, on this um, kind of pilot curriculum. Um, and I apologize that the text is small, but I am gonna kind of zoom in as we go through this so you can see it a little bit better. Um, so um, just a little bit of background. Um, so critical care experience is commonly recommended um, as part of medical school training and specifically is recommended by residency program directors. However, it is not um, frequently offered in medical schools um, in one of the, um, surveys that were done for the 2019 to 2020 academic year, so only two years ago, only 40% of medical schools reported critical care as a required clerkship. And so I think schools are starting to move more towards including that because it's really a key part of medical training, especially intern year and, um, and for some residency programs. Um, and so at the University of Colorado, um, with the new curriculum that's coming out, all students will be required to complete a rotation in critical care. So as part of that, um, we're trying to develop um, how that rotation will look like and um, thus develop this critical care pilot curriculum for fourth year medical students. Um, and I'll get into the details of that in a second. So um, we have had 15 total students go through this curriculum. Um, again, all fourth year medical students all electively agreed to participate. Um, it was over two different sessions that we've held this thus far. And a total of 10 students were kind of dedicated um, students that were going through the pilot. And then there were five additional students who were on other kind of critical care electives um, and then decided to join us for the simulation and didactic sessions. Um, so then kind of moving into the specifics of the course. Um, so the structure kind of consisted of two key components. So there was an ICU experience. And so students rotated through the ICU wards over that four week period of time. Um, they could have rotated through a medical ICU, a surgical ICU, or the cardiothoracic ICU. And it tended to be that they would be in one ICU for two weeks and then switch to a different ICU for two weeks so that they could get a more well-rounded experience. And then we also had didactic, didactic and simulation sessions that were held about twice weekly. The didactics were about one to two hours, and then we had about an hour plus of simulation following that um, to allow them to apply the knowledge that um, we had discussed. And so here in figure one, if I kind of zoom in, you can see a sample of how the, the didactics and the simulations were laid out. So again, usually we had a lecture for one to two hours at the beginning, and then would have a follow-up simulation to the, allow the, the students to put into practice um, what we were um, discussing. And we covered, you know, kind of general ICU topics like sepsis, hypoxemia, um, we did um, a whole week on mechanical ventilation because many students repeat, reported feeling less comfortable with that, which is not surprising given that uh, mechanical ventilation is a harder skill to master. Um, and then kind of rounded it out with, with some more specific topics at the end. Okay. 
Um, and then in terms of our kind of assessment, so specifically for the students, they had three formal assessments that contributed to their grade. Um, so there was assessments um, of them while they were on the medical wards and that was done by their ICU attendings. We gave them a multiple choice test at the beginning and end of the elective, um, partially for us to see how much they improved over the course of the elective. And then again, their kind of grade on that final test contributed to their overall course grade. And then we did a mega, what we called a mega simulation at the end of the course, um, which allowed students to demonstrate the knowledge and skills they had learned during the elective. Um, so they kind of got to put into practice and show us, show us what they know. And then in terms of how we evaluated our course, we gave them a pre and a post course survey um, to understand um, kind of what their general experience was prior to going into the critical care elective, and then try and figure out how the critical care elective may have changed their kind of knowledge or attitudes over the course of the four weeks. And then that all um, the survey feedback was anonymous. Okay. So moving on to the results. Um, so we had um, starting with kind of our pre and post um, anonymous survey, just looking at the course, 10 of those, uh, 10 of the 14 students um, who had completed that survey reported ever having rotated through an ICU. So, you know, about two thirds of the students had had some critical care experience. Um, and interestingly, only about 40% had ever managed a ventilated patient. Um, so again, that tends to be a skill that a lot of medical students, it seems like don't get. And so part of this course is addressing that limitation in knowledge. Um, we are happy to see that at the end of the course, 100% of the students said they would recommend our course um, to their classmates. And then um, I think kind of one of the bigger pieces of data we had, I'm gonna kind of zoom in over here to um, table one, is that we had asked students about 16 specific um, ICU related topics or clinical scenarios, and those are listed here on the left. Of those six of those 16, the majority of students reported feeling uncomfortable or very uncomfortable with them at the beginning of the course. And those again are designated here by these red dots. But I would say, and then we resurveyed them at the end of the course. And of those um, kind of six topics that specifically patient, or I'm sorry, students felt uncomfortable with, all of them reported feeling or like the average was they all felt somewhat comfortable or very comfortable by the end of the course. And even for those topics that not all students felt uncomfortable with at the beginning, you can see there's a kind of a large improvement with patient comfort and knowledge around these kind of 16 kind of core critical care topics over the um, course of the four weeks, which um, we are very happy to see. Um, and then kind of looking at some of our objective data, I'll point you here to table two, kind of looking at their knowledge assessments. Um, so you can see that um, on the 30 um, question multiple choice test that we gave them, um, the students significantly improved from the beginning to the end. Um, we did um, kind of section out these students into those who were kind of in the dedicated critical care curriculum versus those who were more in the traditional curriculum. And so not necessarily getting quite as structured of a rotation. Um, and you can see that the, the students who were in the critical care curriculum tended to do a little bit better um, over the course of the, or on the knowledge assessment at the end. Um, but they also started out a little bit higher. So it's hard to know um, exactly if that's true or not. Um, let's see. And then um, we asked students as well for um, kind of free text feedback about the course. And we had a lot of positive feedback, including students say that the rotation helped to demystify the terror of being in the ICU and it improved their understanding and comfort with critical care. Um, and I think many students really like the simulation portion of the elective. Um, and then we also asked for specific areas of feedback, which are um, some of the key ones are listed here in table three. And those included kind of decreasing lecture time in favor of increasing more hands-on teaching and simulation, um, trying to get more hands-on experience with like the ICU machines such as IV pumps and ventilators, um, incorporating some simulation on rapid responses and code blue response, um, and then potentially including some lectures on more specialty specific ICU topics and things that people were asking for were things like perioperative care in the ICU, 
more on cardiogenic shock and acute coronary syndrome and ECMO. And then just overall in trying to increase critical care procedure exposure while on the wards. Um, okay. And so overall, I would say, you know, I think we've successfully created a kind of a critical care pilot rotation for fourth year medical students that incorporates both didactic simulation and kind of hands-on experience um, on the wards. I certainly think there are, you know, some challenges with this specific um, rotation, um, which include how do you um, you know, incorporate this into a, um, and to include all of the fourth year medical students and not just like a small selection of students and having enough kind of faculty support to um, allow this rotation to run throughout the year. Um, but overall, I think, you know, the structure that we have is a good one. Um, and one thing I didn't include on this poster that I should mention is we did actually um, survey the first group of students who went through this who are now first year interns um, at around December or so of this year. And of the only four students answered the survey, but all of those students still said that they um, would recommend their rotation to their classmates. They felt like it gave them kind of a step up compared to their um, co-interns in terms of their comfort with ICU patients and specifically like cross covering ICU patients at night by themselves. Um, and so overall, I think we have a good structure just trying to figure out again how to um, and to carry this out on a bigger scale, I think is probably the biggest challenge going forward. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ryman, so much for the hard work and um, these great results. Um, I do agree with you. Scaling is going to be difficult. And I also think bringing in different specialties to make sure we can do this for people who are destined to pediatrics, OB, surgery, et cetera, is going to be another um, important thing. And then yesterday we heard a really good presentation about the simulated um, training for interns or residents, I guess, um, in medicine uh, with, um, you know, the, for the response to the um, METs and to cardiac arrest. And I think kind of like overlapping some of that might be a way to do scalable things that are hands-on. I see Lexi has her hand raised. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm so excited about this. Um, Annie, thank you so much for sharing and for all of the hard work curriculum. Um, my mic's unmuted, right? Um, I, I was just curious about um, with the simulation sessions that you're doing, are there specific metrics that you're using to evaluate the learners and specifically also with a mega code? Mm -hmm. um, because it would be really interesting to um, to kind of collaborate and think about metrics, you know, both with our um, cardiac arrest simulation um, project as well. Yeah, I mean, I think ours, uh, our assessments are still, um, they, they could use some work. We do have um, like a kind of a checklist of things that we would expect students to incorporate. Again, many of the simulation sessions come right after a lecture and we try and give them like a framework for how to approach something during a lecture. And then we ask them to put that into practice. Um, so, um, so some of our assessment includes that for the mega simulation, it's, um, you know, again, it's, it's something that they kind of, we should have given them a framework for over the course and we expect them to put into practice. But certainly I think there is room for improvement and would love um, any tips or tricks or <laughs> feedback you have, so. Yeah, I feel like we should um, have a, make a meeting offline after all this. If yeah. Your group and our group. Yeah. Definitely should. All right, thanks so much again. And while Dr. Feinstein puts up her poster, um, the title of their abstract is, it's nice to know I'm not alone, the impact of an offline online life coaching program on wellness in graduate medical education, a qualitative analysis. Thanks, Dr. Feinstein, for being here. Hi, everyone. I'm Tyra Feinstein, and I am a general internist. I work here at the Lowry Internal Medicine Clinic, um, which is a continuity clinic site for the internal medicine residents. Um, and I am also a certified life coach. And I have found that life coaching and medical education have culminated and overlapped in so many ways uh, since I started coaching. And uh, one of the biggest thoughts that I had after receiving coaching myself and then getting certified as a life coach was just this overwhelming 
wish that I had had these skills in medical training. I mean, maybe even before medical training, um, being able to look at my thoughts non-judgmentally and name and describe an emotion, which are two big life coaching skills, I think would have been really useful. Um, but certainly during residency where I think some of the real, uh, toxic thought patterns crop up for trainees that eventually lead to burnout, um, and even bigger problems. So I teamed up with a colleague here, Dr. Adrian Mann, to create a life coaching program for residents here at CU. We built a six-month curriculum. Uh, it's all online, and it's sort of founded on two live group coaching calls per week. So the program is called Better Together Physician Coaching, and on it, we host two one hour group coaching calls, just like this on zoom, uh, by either Adrian or myself leading these residents through, um, brief, but deep sort of 10 to 15 minutes of life coaching in front of each other. Um, and then the rest of the program is this curriculum that includes worksheets and webinars and, um, some bonus content around life coaching concepts that lives on our secure members only website. So we spent most of 2020 building the program. Um, we each got some uh, external and internal grants to help us build this online curriculum. And then we decided to pilot it here in 2021 with 101 women residents. We targeted women because the burnout gap is so profound between women and men. Um, along with the other sort of wellness metrics like self-compassion and imposter syndrome, but burnout is our primary aim. So for this study, we enrolled female identifying residents here at CU. We recruited in December of 2020, we surveyed everyone, and then we randomized them to either intervention from January to July of 2021, or no intervention or residency as usual during that time. And then at the end of that, we surveyed everybody and then interviewed 17 of the participants, which is what I'm presenting today. I wanna to mention that we then offered the coaching program to our control group after this study was done. So we did this in a staggered fashion so that nobody who wanted coaching didn't get it. Um, what I'm sharing with you here is our qualitative analysis of those 17 participant interviews. I will share our quantitative findings later. I think it's noon or 1230 um, to show how we did on the burnout metrics, metrics and other wellness metrics. Um, but this one, we did sort of a deep dive into how it was impactful, what the resident experience of the coaching program was, um, and to help us make it better. So we had um, two uh, research assistants conduct 17 interviews with um, volunteer, volunteer participants of our program, and then we coded their transcripts with a rapid domain analysis. Um, we used sort of the methods that you can see here. I won't dive too much into that since I really want to talk about the results. What we found can really be summarized in three overall overarching themes. The first and um, probably biggest theme that the residents who had participated in this program said that they got out of it was that they really liked our tool for metacognition. We call it the thought model or the model. And this is the framework that it, Dr. Mann and I use to coach residents. It's here in that middle section across the top. Um, and it's not rocket science. It's based on CBT, also a little bit of acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, but it's just a, it's Adrian calls it the soap note for your brain, but it's a way to look at your thoughts with um, curiosity and non-judgment and mostly to separate the circumstance from your feelings and realize that there's a thought in between. And so that's what most of our coaching is founded on. What the residents talked about in their interviews was that not only was that powerful them when, for them when they were watching and receiving direct coaching, but they found themselves using the thought model outside of coaching sessions and after the program was over even um, to sort of help them as a healthy coping tool for ongoing struggles. Um, the second theme that came up was surprising, actually, because it was 
a theme around real community building. Um, we were going to call it a Me Too theme because so many of the residents had quotes along the lines of, I can't believe I'm not the only one with these thoughts. Um, and that really stems from the fact that what we offer is a group coaching model. And that's very different than most of the other life coaching interventions out there in medicine, which are one-on-one -on -one coaching models. Um, it was a vulnerable and maybe even risky ask to request that people come up for group coaching in this program, especially as residents. Um, we ask them to come at us with their really intimate and vulnerable feelings in front of each other. And we were unsure if they'd feel comfortable. What we found was that um, not everybody did ask for coaching, but there were most people in the program did ask for coaching at some point, and some asked a lot. And on a group coaching call, it takes maybe a couple minutes to get people warmed up. But once they did warm up, um, sort of the floodgates opened. And so, I mean, last night we're still doing the coaching program. So we have a cohort running right now. And I coached last night. I coached a, um, you know, a neurosurgery R7 on her imposter syndrome thoughts. And then immediately after that, I coached a peds intern on the exact same thoughts. And so that normalization of experience that me too, or aha epiphany was able to happen fast on a group coaching model. Our calls are all recorded. So um, the residents can watch them later if they miss them. And that was a huge, powerful theme that came up for them was that sense of community they had with an online Zoom-based program where they don't even necessarily see each other's faces. It's a webinar format. So you only come up if you want to, if you choose to, you can remain anonymous. And so for them to, for us to have community creation as a theme was um, actually surprising. In retrospect, now I understand it. The third theme was that they loved the um, customizable experience. So we have three modalities. I've spoken a lot about the live coaching. That's the one I'm most excited about. But we also have these um, workbooks that I briefly mentioned. It's 25 weekly worksheets um, that we created. They're three to five pages long, and they're just prompts for narrative reflection. Um, and they're each accompanied by a short YouTube video of Adrian and I in our living room explaining the concept. Um, and so many of them mentioned that they liked that idea of sort of choose your own adventure. And then the third way they could receive coaching is through an anonymous ask for coaching forum on the website where you can post completely anonymously with a challenge in your resident life. Um, and receive written coaching back by either Adrian or I the next day. Um, that's all posted for everyone to read. So people loved the, well, the different ways to interact with the program. They talked about that a lot. Nothing was required. It was built for busy residents. So our calls are sort of after hours as best possible. We also offer weekend calls, but we don't expect them to show up and we record them on purpose. Um, they can interact with it in a way that works for them as much or as little as possible. So they liked that. Um, we are in the process of scaling this up to a national level. We are expanding this. I've enrolled 20 GME programs across the nation to see if we get similar results um, and are planning to mirror exactly what we did here at CU that will start in September. We have 10 volunteer physician coaches working with us um, to make this possible and are super excited to see if these results hold across the nation. You know, the biggest finding feasibility wise for us was really that um, the group model makes this extremely scalable. The huge effort for Adrian and I was creating the program, but now it's created, the curriculum is built. And so actually running it now is as little as an hour or two a week for each of us, which is enormously different than one-on-one -on -one coaching programs where I need an hour for one person. I'm able to reach 117 right now in one hour a week. So that's what we're mostly excited about with um, expanding. Oh, yay. Hi, Adrian. Feel free to unmute yourself and say things. I didn't know if you'd be able to come. Thanks for joining us, 
Adrian, uh, Dr. Mann, we're really excited to have you both here. This is outstanding work and I really see some excitement about the scalability. I wonder if you might consider doing a pilot of just the recorded components with some of our fourth year medical students to see if them watching the videos without having you know, the whole rest of the thing might be helpful since you're seeing sense of community with just a watch thing because I can 100% tell you and uh, that they have some of those same imposter thoughts running through their heads um, and would love an opportunity to, to do this. Well, um, if there are any questions, I'm gonna uh, ask uh, Dr. Ford to go ahead and start sharing yours. Um, but if there are any um, folks who uh, have a quick question for Dr. Feinstead or Dr. Mann, um, Congratulations again on your great work. Your your next project, your proposal is up at 12.15 today um, for those who want more. All right, happy to collaborate with you if you're interested in getting those fourth year students um, involved. That's such a good idea. I'm really excited about that actually. What a great idea. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, uh, Dr. Ford, thank you for joining us with your abstract entitled Development of a Curricular Session on Advocacy through Service as a Pediatric Expert on a Child Fatality Review Team. And also shout out, congratulations to your mentorship of one of our students who also presented yesterday. Uh, thank you. Hopefully my sound is coming through okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Rashawn Ford. I'm a child abuse pediatrician uh, with the Department of Pediatrics at Children's Hospital Colorado. And as Dr. Uh, Zimmer, who mentioned the, the project that I am working on, um, involves advocacy through services of child fat on, on child fatality review team. Um, the background on this is that the American Academy of Pediatrics and ACGME um, really support and stress the importance of advocacy as part of pediatric uh, training requirements. Um, but looking through, what's been noted is that there aren't really specific or universal um, you know, programs uh, and, and, and how different programs approach different aspects of advocacy differ amongst programs there. This project, interestingly enough, was sparked through the alignment of a couple of um, you know, different things. And so um, one of my colleagues uh, who I, I worked with uh, through this helped with um, an American Academy of Pediatrics child death review uh, grant, which served uh, to, through kind of recognition of the need to increase engagement of uh, pediatric providers in this process of child fatality review and advocacy, and to increase engagement of uh, pediatric providers with their local AAP chapters. And at the same time, um, one of a uh, fellow colleague, uh, pediatric colleague, Hillary Stemple, um, who I gave an acknowledgement to at the end of this, who runs the intern, the pediatric residency um, advocacy block, um, especially through the pandemic, was looking for um, to increase opportunities or develop opportunities, especially through the pandemic to connect learners with uh, members of the community and, and officials in the community for, for advocacy, um, because a lot of that had been lost through the pandemic. So um, through this, uh, I had the opportunity to, to work with a, the Child Fatality Prevention System, um, which is a statewide multidisciplinary public health model of, of, of child fatality review, um, which goes through and reviews child fatality data to describe trends and collect data to analyze trends and patterns and to ultimately um, recommend prevention strategies through that, that are presented and published in an annual report and delivered to the legislature. So um, this project serves to connect learners um, through the advocacy block and on our child abuse pediatrics elective to part of this system. So not the entire system. And so I'll describe a little bit of what that is. And so we've delivered and inserted them in kind of maybe some of the gears <laughs> you know, of the entire system here. And so the overall objective um, of this was kind of multifold here. And so it's really engaging our learners in this process to kind of bolster their knowledge and kind of ingrain them into some unique advocacy skills um, through child fatality prevention. Uh, this also would involve um, gaining knowledge and ability to discuss and offer and advocate for prevention, recommend, prevention recommendations and strategies that are equitable and with uh, disparities and inequities in mind that uh, contribute to child fatalities. So 
um, our, as we see in our methods, our population here involved pediatric interns on the required advocacy block, um, which is around a handful or so per month, and maybe two or three of them are able to kind of make a session there. And our um, child pediatrics, uh, child abuse pediatrics elective learners in here. So the session um, in total is around three and a half hours or so, and it involves um, a pre-session survey, which really serves to kind of get like just some baseline um, information that includes um, uh, one, just kind of level of interest kind of pre kind of doing this uh, and level of engagement. How do we view kind of this process and a pediatrician's role on this? Um, and baseline level of, uh, of knowledge and comfort discussing uh, historical and structural inequities and disparities that contribute to child fatalities and um, and drafting recommendation preventions with that. Following that, there is um, some pre-session material, which is educational in, in nature to really provide a backdrop for the work that they're going to be doing. The, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a published policy statement regarding pediatricians' role on child fatality review teams and the importance of it. So they'll read through that. The other part is to get a sense, um, which we see here, um, perusing the annual report that comes out each July and is presented to legislature, just to kind of see what kinds of, what, what is the ultimate end product and how the work that they're gonna be doing at these gear levels at local team meetings kind of filters up and results in this process here. And a presentation by the um, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment epidemiologist who compiled um, inequity and disparity data so they can give them a backdrop for which they can present go in, and go into the meeting. Then there's a briefing session with myself and a public health nurse through Tri-County Health who coordinates the team and then goes through the meeting and actively participates in um, the multidisciplinary review data, um, data collection, and discussing prevention recommendation strategies. And that's followed by a debrief just to kind of get some reflection and um, processing, discussing heavy things like child fatality <laughs> review. Um, especially because it can be pretty heavy and so making sure that we are working on resiliency and a post-session survey that kind of um, assesses kind of change and attitude and change of if this was effective um, in that. So what I will say, um, this is a uh, work that's currently in progress. Uh, the project was implemented in the fall of 2001, 2021 and these kind of trial sessions where we kind of um, had um, a couple of different groups of our elective learners and the pediatric residents um, in there. And it allowed us um, to really kind of see how much material we had to kind of kind of add into there to kind of make it effective and if there were any gaps. And now the full implementation with the data collection has started in, um, well, as sessions have resumed uh, last month. What we found, um, and just with the less than two handfuls of, of learners who have come through and just some qualitative and reflective information that's come back was generally positive in that um, really what learners are finding really interesting is that interaction with community and public health officials, um, the discussion about the disparities and equities and how that kind of informs our prevention kind of, you know, process was really interesting there. Of course, there were a lot of heavy kind of emotional things, especially on days where some counties go through and talk about just suicides and deaths and, and things like that for, for most of the time. One thing that I found that was interesting that allowed me to um, add more things into the briefing and information was um, the gap in learners being able to see the big picture of the system from the local level and those gears and how that kind of related to um, kind of this report there. And so adding in a little bit more information and briefing allows that big picture to kind of add some appreciation to that work. Um, so I hope, uh, you know, now that this is collecting data and getting evaluated, that I'll see the um, efficacy of this and hopefully will be something that uh, learners will find uh, formative. Um, this has been um, by virtue of the grant that we have, has been included and kind of report back to some of the things that we were doing with that. And I hope that this will be generalizable and being able to be presented back to AAP kind of at a wider meeting um, so that other programs may kind of take a uh, note from this and, and maybe develop something kind of in their own programs in their state. And so I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Um, and while we transition your poster um, to our next presenter, I had a, a couple of quick comments first this is i can imagine how difficult um this work is 
Um, and so congratulations to launching something in such a difficult environment and also um, taking care of folks during it. It reminded me of a um, presentation that we had yesterday on secondary traumatic stress um, among medical students and other learners. And I think there's probably a space for collaboration there between you and Dr. Adams um, and the clinical clerkships in that sort of thinking about trauma-informed education, the way we think about trauma-informed care. Um, the second thought that I had was to link this to our advocacy components of the later parts of the new TREC curriculum, where um, students are required to develop some leadership skills in the advocacy space, and Chad Stigreth, whom you know well, would be a good person to connect with on that. Any quick questions from the audience before we transition to our next uh, poster presentation? Thanks and congratulations again. Um, all right. Our next abstract uh, is coming from Dr. Sa uh, Sarah Slavin and uh, the title of the abstract and her collaborators is Revising End of Life Curriculum in the ICU. All right, go for it, Sarah. And thank you. Thank you. Let me just share my screen quickly. All right, I hope everyone can see this. I'm so sorry, I'm realizing, of course, today how small my pie charts appear on this uh, uh, poster. Hopefully you've got- The great thing about Zoom is we can make you. it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so my presentation is uh, end of life curriculum in the ICU, time for an update. Um, a little bit of background. I'm a third year categorical internal medicine resident. I'm going into uh, cardiology fellowship starting uh, this summer. And I have um, a strong interest in acute care and ICU level care. Um, so one of the things that I noticed while going throughout my residency training was that we do have a lack of uh, preparation for end of life conversations that are very common in the acute care settings. Um, and I don't think this has been ever more pertinent than during a global pandemic where we've been having to have these conversations with very little support, um, often in very difficult uh, scenarios by a phone um, and you know, late at night. Um, and having talked with some of my colleagues, I realized that there was um, a general feeling that uh, we need improved, uh, improved end of life curriculum throughout residency. This has been something that's actually being actively worked on by the palliative care folks. Um, and so when I was going through my intern year, we only had a single lecture during our Wednesday education sessions on this topic. Now it's a couple of lectures as well as small group discussions and they've uh, created a palliative care rotation. Um, but one of the issues that I found with our current setup having most of the education occurring during these West sessions is that it's very far removed from um, the time that you're actually holding these conversations in the ICU. Um, and so I wanted to see first and foremost, whether um, my fellow residents uh, felt the same way that I did, that this is in need of some improvement and um, changing from the end of life curriculum occurring in um, the West sessions to more uh, occurring more closely to our actual ICU experience. Um, so this is just the initial needs-based assessment, um, which was sent out as an anonymous questionnaire across the internal medicine residency. Um, the responses were, were collected anonymously. We had about 58 out of 170 residents respond. Um, so about one third responded. And of that, um, in my tiny pie charts, um, the, uh, the, the breakdown was about one third, one third, one third for uh, PGYs one through three. Um, about 80 plus percent of respondents had held um, or led an end of life conversation in the ICU, but only about half of those um, had actually ever had formal training um, on how to conduct those conversations. And also notably, most of these conversations were being led for the first time as uh, during the first half of intern year. 
some were even um, in medical school. Um, and our end of life uh, West sessions were only occurring at the end of intern year. So this was one immediate area um, for improvement. Also notably, at the time of, of um, responses to the survey, um, about 30% of uh, respondents felt either uncomfortable or very uncomfortable with leading these conversations. Only about 15% of respondents felt very comfortable. So there's clearly a need for improved education um, in holding end of life conversations. I was also interested in figuring out exactly what uh, components of end of life conversations people felt most daunted by. Um, and what um, our results show is that the, the areas of most concern were um, navigating conflict between patients and family members in the team, uh, turning off uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators, managing symptoms at end of life, pronouncing patient death, um, offering autopsy and discussing organ donation. Uh, surprisingly, most residents actually felt comfortable with um, having a conversation about changing code status when a patient's prognosis um, suddenly turned for the worse. Um, they also felt, uh, most felt comfortable with uh, talking through the logistics of how a transition to comfort care works um, and what the steps are in that. Um, so with that, um, was also looking at how residents felt um, end of life curriculum should be taught and where. Um, and this was um, a multiple, multiple choice question where, where um, respondents could actually choose multiple different answers. Um, and, and most people did choose to do that. Um, based off of the results that we got, it looks like most people feel that it that end of life curriculum should be taught in a combination of ICU didactics and West sessions. So overall, um, we found that there is a need to improve end of life education offered to internal medicine residents at uh, University of Colorado. Um, and sorry, I forgot to mention, um, majority felt that they would uh, benefit from simulation based training, either with standardized patients or through role play. Um, unfortunately, working with standardized patients um, is very costly and uh, logistically difficult. Um, we looked at kind of reserving the SIM center um, during the ICU months, but uh, for a, a 30 minute simulation, um, but that was just logistically not possible. So after collecting this needs assessment, um, we have built a just in time uh, simulation based training that will actually be rolled out next week um, at the university ICU. Um, it's gonna be a half hour training. We're, we're starting with just the medical ICU and just the interns. Um, and it will be role play based um, where they will have clinical scenarios. Um, they'll first get a little um, brief intro into um, the spikes in nurses mnemonic. They're just kind of breakdowns of how to approach these end of life conversations and how to respond to emotion. And then they will work through these role play scenarios while having um, two palliative care facilitators present in the room giving uh, re real time feedback. And the hope is that um, having this just in time training during their second week of their ICU rotation after they've gotten their legs under them the first week, um, and then by the second week starting to actually look at conducting these end of life conversations and to have just some tools in their immediate tool pack um, to be able to use. And so once we get it off the ground and running, we're gonna do some pre-surveys to see um, level of comfort before. We're gonna do some immediate post surveys in the week following um, the training sessions. And then we're gonna send out those surveys again, three months later to see if the tools um, that were introduced to them in these just-in-time trainings have led to a longitudinal uh, feeling of improved comfort having these conversations.
Great, thank you, Dr. Slavin. There's a lot of um, evaluation data there and coming. So great job with that. And I appreciate you joining us from your busy service as well. Um, one of the uh, quick comments I had about this was a, maybe even collaborating with Dr. Newmeyer, who's on this about how we do some of these conversations with the um, end of curriculum, the communications mm -hmm. curriculum might be some places we could do it to the chat, something, uh, a link to uh, Vital Talk, which is something that our palliative care colleagues use frequently. It's a, something that residents could do on their own time. I know we're looking for lots of different creative opportunities for people to do some sorts of training and practice on their own. And there's a series of videos and interactive cases about how to have some of these difficult conversations that people could maybe do as pre-work or, or could replace some of that. All right. I love both of those ideas. And Dr. Neumeyer, I'd love both of you. <laughs> Take care. She's cool. All right. Um, for our next abstract, I'm going to introduce uh, Kate Laporta. Kate, thank you for joining us today. Um, and the title of your abstract is Shaping Clinicians Beyond the Textbook, an Interactive Novel, novel Format for Case-Based Learning. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I am, I apologize, I'm in clinic today, so um, I am wearing a mask. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, so my name is Kate Laporta. Um, my colleague Amy Ackerman is on here today as well. Um, oops. Sorry, I'm having some screen issues. Uh -oh. It looks great. It looks okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to keep talking then. Um, how you I had it before? <laughs> what did you say? How you had it before? It kind of went back to small again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I actually can't see anything. I'm gonna try on my new computer. Sorry, give me one second. I apologize. Okay, I'm gonna try on my other computer. So let me just join the meeting here. Okay, I apologize. Can you all hear me now? Yep. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Um, so let me, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can, but it's um, kind of small. If you would like me to um, pull up your poster, I have it here too. Okay. Here. Uh, my colleague Amy Ackerman is on here as well. We are both uh, physician assistants and core faculty at the PA program here on the Anschutz campus. You may know it as the CHAPA program. Um, and we are here today to talk to you about a new case format that we have been working on for the past couple of years. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, in 2018, the CHAPA program launched a new... Oh, my gosh. Share screen, okay. There we go. All right, can you all see that? Sorry, what's going on? Okay, um, the CHAPA program launched a new uh, block-based spiral curriculum. So essentially learners start in the summer of their first year um, with kind of an introductory semester, and then they enter into seven systems-based blocks that they go through throughout that first academic year. Um, and then they come back to those same systems-based blocks in their second didactic year, um, building upon the content that they learned in their first year, and of course learning new content. Part of the design of this curriculum was a two-hour session built into each and every week throughout the curriculum for clinical cases. Um, the idea of this clinical case time was to help learners integrate knowledge that they learned that week with clinical skills that they've learned, knowledge that they may have learned in the previous block or even in the previous year. Um, and what we found over the course of the past 
couple of years running this curriculum is that different blocks were using case time very differently. So some blocks were um, early on in the curriculum asking learners to maybe come up with an assessment and plan when really we felt that they ought to be focusing on the basics of taking a really solid history and building that skill before they move on to more advanced skills. So this was something that the faculty felt needed some attention. Um, so from that, a case development team was created. Um, Amy and I are both a part of that, along with our colleagues, Kelsey and Denise, who are listed here on this poster. Um, and we were tasked with really creating a standardized format that everyone in the program could use across the curriculum. Um, so Amy will talk to you a little bit about the details of this specific case format that we came up with in just a minute. One thing that I want to talk about first is this colorful little schema that you see here. Um, so what we decided to do before launching into the case format was to try to map our program specific competencies and milestones across the curriculum with how we're running case time. So we wanted to tie our cases back to those competencies and milestones and use case time as a tool to help students meet those benchmarks and achieve those end of year and then end of program competencies. Um, so for example, one of the competencies that we have for students at the end of their first academic year um, is to formulate a broad differential diagnosis for a given chief complaint. Um, so one thing that you can't see on this screen is that we came up with an additional timeline of specific milestones for students to reach that competency by the end of their first year. So you'll see that we introduce um, intro to history taking and then intro to clinical reasoning and assessment in their first summer with us on campus. And then throughout the fall semester, the, the students get to practice those skills um, in clinical skills sessions and in case time. And the first milestone that we have for students is by say mid fall, which is around this GI GU renal block. Um, we expect them to be able to formulate a top three, their top three differential diagnoses for a given chief complaint. So a relatively basic ask in terms of medical reasoning. By the end of the fall, we asked them to formulate a slightly broader differential diagnosis um, and starting to add in some medical decision making. So we're using these, these milestones throughout the didactic curriculum in case time to assess whether our students are getting towards that um, competency of the for the end of the first year. Um, and then we really use these milestones to guide the clinical reasoning questions that we're asking students throughout um, the cases and guiding the focus of the case itself and also the level of difficulty. So as I said before, we start really basic in terms of focusing on the history. We ask students to go through old carts um, and really hone that skill of history taking before we move on to physical exam techniques and medical decision making. So I will pass it off to Amy to um, discuss our case format. Thanks, Kate. So we developed the patient, provider, observer, and reporter, or PPOR format, to utilize learner um, role-playing when working through the cases. The format encourages the learners to immerse themselves in the patient presentation. At the beginning of each session, the learner who portrays the patient should quickly review the case before they begin and try to put themselves in the patient's shoes, considering how the medical problem may affect them physically, cognitively, and, emo and emotionally. And then the learner portraying the provider should run the encounter as if they were truly in a clinical setting. So we really want to push that. Um, we want them to immerse themselves in each case. Um, we ask the teams to think broadly when first developing their differential. And then we emphasize that this is a time for them to practice taking a history, performing their physical exam, and developing their communication techniques, more so in the first year than the second year. Um, and we really want them to be able to obtain enough information to then use their clinical reasoning skills to create a more narrowed and appropriate differential. The learners who take on the observer and reporter roles provide additional information to the provider during the case. And they may include physical exam findings, lab and diagnostic imaging results, um, as well as act as scribes to be able to report out to the class when we rejoin to debrief the case. 
The observer also makes note of the provider's communication skills and provides feedback after the session, which I think is a really cool part of this, this peer-to-peer -peer, um, feedback. Um, our cases are highly modifiable and they can fit any topic. They can really work in any health professions program. Because this is a standardized format, it relies less on faculty development for each case, which reduces some of the workload for our course directors. Um, for future plans, um, we plan to um, explain the PPO format maybe a little bit better to the incoming students as they begin each summer to encourage their investment in this process. Um, our current students um, saw what it was like before we made these standardized changes. And so you know, we just wanna get our new learners on board as soon as they start. Um, in future years, we also want to specifically query learners about their experience using this PPOR format, as well as assess the um, success of case time by looking at learners' performance in standardized assessments like our OSCE cases in the CAPE. Um, we're already doing that a little bit, but I think we want to do have a little bit more formal process for that. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for Thank you for this presentation and the abstract. I, I love that idea of the observer. We're doing a little bit of that also in the MD program. And I wonder about having a recording of this so that your first year students can watch it in advance and know what they're kind of getting into ahead of time. Um, we also found that there's some discomfort around that. And then assessment of, of clinical reasoning is so difficult. And I'll send you all a, a link to um, a tool that was presented in the hospital medicine um, program yesterday um, about that too. That'd be great. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, Thanks thank so much. you. All right. We're a few minutes behind, but we're going to, we're, we're doing okay. Thanks everybody for your attention today. Um, while Dr. Madison gets her uh, poster up, uh, I'll just let you know that our next presentation is Connecting Older Adults with Students Through Interprofessional Telecare, COSTIT, uh, a program evaluation. All right, let me get this pulled up here. And oh, let's see. Sorry, right. thanks, Madison. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, I can go ahead and get started. So my name is Madison. I'm a second year in the School of Medicine here to talk about COSTIT, which is short for Connecting Older Adults with Students Through Interprofessional Telecare. Um, so just to give some background, COSTA was originally a student volunteer-based program founded during the height of COVID, so this is in 2020, in response to the reported feelings of loneliness and isolation really felt by everybody, but especially by the older adults in our community. And when we looked at the um, qualitative feedback received from the original cohort of students, there was a lot of remarkable self-reported positive changes in attitudes towards older adults and in their communication skills. Some direct quotes from students include, I was able to work on my communication skills and experience a different perspective. Um, and um, it takes time to get to know older adults. They have a lot of stuff going on in their lives too. It's important to recognize that. And so after hearing all of this, COSTIT was expanded to include the NP program, medicine program, pharmacy dentistry, um, and we've continued to collect more qualitative data since that time. We also know that there's a growing need for providers with geriatric specific training, given the growing older adult population. Um, by 2030, which is not too far away, one in five people in the US will be 65 years and older. Um, and so the purpose of this initial analysis was to, uh, was to assess the efficacy of COSTIT on improving student attitudes towards older adults um, and looking at their communication skills with this population. So how I did this was the older adults were recruited from various community facilities and they're randomly paired with students. So students would make phone calls every week to every two weeks. And these were social phone calls. Um, some suggestions and guidelines were given, but these conversations were largely unstructured. And then the students were surveyed before and after on a semester basis. The survey included a variety of perceptional questions and free text responses aimed at assessing knowledge, communication, and attitudes towards this demographic. Um, and so here are some of our results. This is aggregate data um, from the beginning of COSTIT to December of this past year. In total, we have about, uh, we have 375 responses. And this main figure here is looking at the student's self-rated communication confidence. This is on like a Likert scale. So the stuff on the left in the blue, the orange and the gray are 
towards that not confident, not really confident side. And then these yellow and blue colors on the right side are fairly to very confident. And what we're seeing between the pre and post survey results is that there's a shift away from the not really confident to some confident towards the other side of fairly confident to very confident. So we're seeing more of those um, students reporting feel more confident when talking to and interviewing older adult patients. We also asked a question in the survey about stress level when talking to an older adult patient. Um, and basically the question asked, like, do you feel stressed while talking to an older adult person? Um, and the students responding um, that they were stressed was reduced from 18.4% to 10.67%. Um, students who participated were also better able to define ageism. Um, so we saw an increase from 74.1% to 80.3% of students picking the correct definition in this survey. So those were some of our early results. Um, and we are seeing that COSA is a program that can be implemented across a variety of different health professional programs, which is really important giving the care of an older adult often involves an interdisciplinary team. Um, we're also seeing that COSIP provides students who are early in their training a chance to really build up these communication skills and develop empathy through these longitudinal relationships with an actual um, patient. So this program is still growing and changing and our data collection is still ongoing. Our original survey that is featured here is more heavily geared towards internal program evaluation. Um, but as of January 2022, we've progressed to the use of a validated survey. It's called the COCO24, um, and it's used within this field to evaluate attitudes um, and knowledge about the older adult population. And we're going to use it to more comprehensively and in a more standardized way evaluate uh, COSIT's impact on ageism and student attitudes. A little farther down the road, we're also considering ways to expand the valuation to include this program's impact on the older adult partner, specifically with metrics uh, regarding loneliness and isolation. Um, that's all down the road. We're still um, anticipating another round of data collection in the spring. Um, big thank you to the Seniors Clinic and the faculty in the NP program, some of whom are here today, um, also critical in the administration and improvement of this program. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> Let me unmute. Thank you, Madison. That was a fantastic presentation. Dr. Rodriguez has a question for you, but I just wanted to say how proud I am of, of this work. Um, 375 participants, that's really fantastic um, and, and a really great intervention. Go ahead, Jenny. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Madison. <clears throat> I echo Dr. Zimmer's um, comments about how impressive this is. And I just had a couple of questions. Um, was this on a volunteer basis or was this connected to uh, specific coursework or um, electives that, that you took, you and other students are taking? Yeah, so that actually depends on the, um, the program that it's housed in. So some, some of the programs have made it actually mandatory part of their curriculum and others such as in the MD program right now that I'm in, it's on a voluntary basis. Okay, and mm -hmm. does it run throughout the whole year? It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. We just collect um, our data each semester. And it okay. kind of depends depending on the program, obviously. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And are you open to including additional students? I don't, I don't wanna speak for our PT students, but I think this would be a fantastic opportunity for them to participate as well. Yeah, love, we love enthusiasm. We love, you know, bringing people into uh, this space and this kind of learning. And um, uh, definitely we can connect later and talk about it. Um, in the past, the limiting factor, um, some of the times has been recruiting enough older adult partners. Sure. So we're still working on, you know, establishing more relationships with different community, with different communities um, and trying to expand like the number of older adult partners that we have, but I'm happy to chat more about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll, I'll send you an email. Yeah, I can put it in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And thanks, Madison. One, wearing my diversity and inclusion hat, I think about including um, the IAT, the Implicit Association Test, uh, related to um, age. Uh, maybe as a pre-component of it so that people have a sense of um, their bias. I happen to be one of those people who's biased towards older um, adults. I have to remind myself as an educator of young people um, to think about checking that bias, but maybe consider including that. 
Um, our next presenter, uh, Dr. Mary Melton, is somebody who's also a CU graduate, probably be interested in your project as well. Um, but Mary is talking to us today, Dr. Melton, about a different topic, uh, primary care essentials, developing clinician educators through a near peer led or <coughs> ambulatory curriculum supported by digitally available teaching materials. Thanks, Dr. Melton, for joining us. Thank you. Just gonna get my slideshow going here. All right. Um, hi everyone, I'm Mira Melton. I'm a current geriatrics fellow. So yes, that last presentation is great and interesting, um, but a former chief resident in internal medicine. And I'm excited to be here today to share with you a curriculum I helped develop along with my colleagues, Ben Treflick, Catherine Gwynn, Yasmin Sacro, and Brandon Bainstad, along with a host of willing learners and teachers um, in the Department of, in of Internal Medicine. So a bit of background, um, through prior work by Drs. Treflick and Sacro, we found that the majority of our internal medicine residents intend to teach um, as part of their career, but there are pretty limited opportunities to develop those teaching skills in an ambulatory setting. So very inpatient focused, but um, limited ambulatory opportunities. We also saw that some of the core primary care topics um, were be deli being delivered at our continuity clinic sites at variable times throughout um, a resident's training. And so they weren't necessarily getting consistent training. And, and for example, you might have been exposed to diabetes as a end of your third year resident, um, third year of residency. So we wanted to develop a core near peer curriculum called primary care essentials. <clears throat> We first identified six core primary care topics that you can see here listed um, in this table. And we felt that these were high yield topics that are pretty standardized um, that we also felt were very essential for interns to be exposed to early on in their first year of residency. We then developed ed interactive educational modules that we posted um, and published on teachim.org, which is a free and publicly available platform where anyone can access the materials. And the materials were all reviewed by expert reviewers. So I wanna um, take a brief look at the interactive content. If you wanna see this more in real time, you can actually link to our, the QR code here in the left-hand corner of my poster. Um, and you can see that closer, but Due to time, we're just gonna kind of zoom in here on the poster and take a look. So each of the modules is an interactive module that's done in a PowerPoint format. And um, you, there's also a facilitator guide and some of these are also accompanied by a video that helps the teacher learn how to teach the content. So for example, here's a hypertension module that was developed and each of the boxes that is round, has rounded edges and is shadowed is actually one that you can click on and it reveals the content. So for example, um, we might be talking about blood pressure, asking learners what they think the goal of blood pressure might be. And after that discussion, you can click on this and it reveals kind of the actual content um, to review with them. Or if we wanna talk about different medications, we might click here, the first uh, four first line agents that shows each of the four types, and then you can click on each of those to reveal more content. So kind of a progressive um, content. I'm gonna scroll down here too to our depression and anxiety module, which is a little bit different, um, has all of the different um, antidepressant classes. You can click on each one to reveal the medications that we commonly associate with those classes. And then on the left-hand side here, we can see which are activating, which are sedating, and then you know, go through all the side effects and see which ones are associated with that. And each of these modules also has a set of cases that are done at the end um, to apply the content. So after developing the modules, we then um, had upper level residents at two of our continuity clinic sites that were assigned to a core teaching topic. They had the option to either use the modules that we developed or create their own content because we didn't want to be exclusive if they wanted to, to start and, and do their own content. And they then presented to their peers in the first block of the year. So following delivery of the curriculum, we surveyed both the interns and residents. Um, we had 70 total participants. Um, 24 were interns and 46 were upper level. And I'm gonna see if I can bring this over. You may have your, your videos covering up our data here, but um, some of the results. So we found that 77% um, of the residents and interns felt that opportunities to teach during a continuity clinic block were important. 
93% valued having access to digitally available teaching materials, and most of them were able to prepare within one to two hours ahead of time, um, and most of them um, ended up using this. Over 90% used the content that was developed. 90% valued having this near-peer teaching environment, so learning from their colleagues, and 93% felt that this primary care essential curriculum was a valuable learning experience. One thing that we wanted to note as a kind of balancing measure, um, and I think was really important, was that 86% of the upper level residents felt that this curriculum was not inferior to faculty delivered content. We didn't want to have inferior content delivered to them. So um, I think overall from this work, we're able to identify a way to integrate near peer teaching into an ambulatory uh, teaching environment that was really acceptable and perceived as non-inferior to faculty teaching from prior years. Um, and we now have content that's developed that can be um, accessed by anyone and, and spread to other, um, disseminated to other, other sites. And I think one thing we really hope to get out of this in the future is to have potentially a more structured feedback system for the resident teachers so they can continue to develop their skills. That was one thing that we had hoped to integrate but didn't have um, as much of a, an opportunity to get that part developed. So hoping that that could be something in the future. And with that, I'm open to any questions. I think Dr. Sacker is on too. So um, we're happy to answer any questions that y'all have. Thanks, Dr. Melton. This is great. And I, I love the, the comment about being uh, non-inferior to faculty teaching. It may be better in some cases, right, because it's standardized. You know, none of us faculty want to hear that necessarily, but um, the standardized <laughs> delivery is often, um, you know, really useful. And I wonder if faculty could also sometimes adopt it and, and use it for their own teaching as well, um, especially around things that they maybe aren't always comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was one thing, you know, kind of identifying some core topics, but not taking over all the teaching time too, so that we have opportunity for both types of teaching um, was one thing we were kind of careful to do as we started rolling this out. How's the, what's the process for keeping them updated? Great question. <laughs> um, I think right now, those of us who wrote them are trying to keep them updated on our own. Um, but the Teach I Am um, module and Dr. Feinstead is kind of the, our champion for that because he developed the, the platform. Um, I think they're kind of trying to work out like just like an up-to-date article, how do these, these things stay up to date? Um, and so that is definitely something I think each year we're gonna have to go back through and make sure we're not um, needing to make changes. Dr. Sacro might not know, might know this where you probably do is um, what type of, is there a module series that is already used by internal medicine? So my program used to use the Yale modules, for example, because they were updated every July and we didn't have to do that work. Um, but obviously that has a cost. We've used Hopkins modules. I know like Mayo modules. I don't know. Is there a new one, Dr. Sacro? I think we have the New England Journal of Medicine 360 yeah. for the That's residents good. as available access. Um, but they're welcome to review them prior to rotation. Nothing specific right now for ambulatory, which is why we tried to do this. Okay, really cool. Great, great work. And I love the QR code, a little innovation there. Um, and I imagine that some of the residents probably use these to teach their teams um, on the floors as well, um, as the topics bleed back and forth between inpatient and outpatient. Yeah, there's also some that have been developed inpatient too. So yes. Well, I'm seeing all kinds of synergies with the talks for today. Our next speaker is Dr. Maureen Bauer. Uh, Dr. Bauer's uh, abstract is entitled Challenging Advanced Learners Through a Protected Longitudinal Curriculum, Innovations in Cardiology. Oh, sorry. Career Readiness Curriculum for Allergy and Immunology Fellows in Training. You're like, not cardiology. Yeah, it's like, not a cardiologist, not but a cardiologist. I'll pretend for the day. Thanks, Dr. Bauer. Of course. Okay. Let me just flip this. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can everybody see my presentation? Sorry. First day back from maternity leave, or I should say second day. Some heavily with baby brain. 
Um, so I'm Maureen Bauer. I'm an assistant professor in the section of pediatric allergy and immunology. And I'm also the fellowship program director for the allergy and immunology training program here at Children's. Um, and I want to thank Bill Anderson, Colin Dutmer, the associate program directors for working on this with me, as well as Dan Atkins, my mentor. So my project is titled, titled A Career Readiness Curriculum for Allergy and Immunology Fellows in Training. So to start with some background, there's actually national data from ACGME accredited allergy and immunology program graduates in 2021 that indicated that up to a quarter had difficulties in obtaining a faculty position with almost three quarters needing to apply to more than four positions. Um, and when I did a gap analysis at the beginning of my teaching scholars program here at CU, I actually identified career readiness. So really um, defined as finding a job in line with their personal interests and being a competitive applicant to be a more pressing unmet need amongst our trainees and graduates than deficits in medical knowledge or procedural competency. And notably, this deficit occurred despite the overwhelming majority attending career development sessions through local or national societies. Um, so I don't wanna to jump to the end, but I do just wanna point out here that it wasn't that our trainees felt these weren't helpful because they were, and I certainly don't wanna discredit all the hard work that goes into those programs. It was more that those provided a base and this was able to add to it. So once I had performed the gap analysis, I performed a targeted needs assessment through the modified Delphi method, where essentially I interviewed all of our graduates and trainees to develop a comprehensive list of all career planning insufficiencies, and from then ask them to rank them by perceived significance or impact to identify really a top list of topics to be addressed at the program level, and this informed the framework for our curriculum design. So the program design, as you can see there in the table, was six different sessions, which I'll go over in a little bit more detail, but in general, they were all in small groups or individual to really facilitate individualized feedback for our trainees. So the first was net networking skills and a job application timeline. And so within networking, I gave examples of emails, some that I had personally written in my past that were good, some that could certainly use some improvement. Um, we went over kind of how to network in person, differences between private practice, academic setting, networking. And this was really in a small group setting with myself, the fellows, and um, three other faculty members. I then provided them with a suggested timeline for various benchmarks along the job search process, when they should be thinking of submitting their CV cover letters, interviews, et cetera. And I got this timeline based on the feedback from all of our trainees in these detailed interviews. Um, the second session was on CV cover letter development, where prior I sent them example templates and example CVs. And then they sent myself as well as three other faculty members their CVs beforehand. So during the session, um, the four faculty members and the trainee kind of went through line by line and we provided detailed feedback on their documents. The third was an informational session on private practice career paths. In this, I partnered with local private practice physicians who were part of the Colorado Allergy and Asthma Society and had leadership positions there. So it certainly had an interest in education um, and they covered topics such as reimbursement models, partner tracks, kind of key questions to ask. We had an academic medicine career path session with our section head where they similarly discussed kind of different promotional tracks, salaries, contract negotiations. The fifth session was actually probably the most well-received, was a Q&A with our prior graduates. Um, so it was a panel discussion on Zoom with all of our recent graduates, half being in private practice, half being in academics, where they discussed kind of everything job search related, salary ranges, how to negotiate contracts, networking, kind of key questions to ask. And the last was interviewed preparedness, where each trainee went through two mock interviews, one simulating a private practice position, one an academic position. And I tailored the scenarios to positions they were actually pursuing, if applicable. And so each session had a faculty member playing the interviewer and another faculty member just observing. So they each received kind of feedback from four different faculty members in these over these two scenarios. For evaluation, I utilized multimodal assessment strategies. So the first was a quantitative survey that I utilized to assess their comfort or knowledge in a topic before and after completion of the curriculum via a seven point Likert scale. So strongly agree to some strongly disagree with in general agree responses indicating higher knowledge or comfort in the area. And as you can see there on the figure, I apologize if this is kind of confusing way to look at, I kind of played around with how to best present this. Within the six topics, interviewed preparedness, 
academic medicine career path knowledge, private practice career path knowledge, CV cover letter development, and net networking skills. Um, blue being pre, orange being post-curriculum. There was a clear trend with the agree responses being on the left to improve knowledge or comfort in each of these topics post-completion of the curriculum. The number, we only have two fellows a year, so the number of people who've completed the curriculum is small, so I couldn't necessarily assess for statistical significance, but there's a clear trend. Um, qualitative interviews really revealed that while similar sessions attended through local or national societies provided a very strong base of general knowledge on how to find a job, the success was really due to it being customizable and providing very individualized feedback. So I provided some sample quotes, but one fellow, for example, felt highly prepared for interviews. There was a question asked during the mock interview that he had gotten specific feedback on, kind of tailored his response and actually felt significantly more prepared in his actual um, interview. And then another quote, the curriculum was beneficial because it was customized to each trainee. It complemented the broader resources available in other settings. So some conclusions or implications, the success of this curriculum was really due to its personalized nature. Um, and as these areas of deficit occurred, despite our trainees attending sessions elsewhere, the curriculum is likely applicable, I would argue, to other allergy and immunology programs, but also other residency and fellowship, fellowship programs as much of this content is not necessarily specific to allergy and immunology. And we would recommend that career planning be routinely incorporated into fellowship curriculums elsewhere. Thank you, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you, um, Dr. Bauer. I wonder about even presenting this at your national allergy meeting as a workshop in terms of speed dating or speed training um, around this. Yeah, I, um, I submitted it for this past year and they asked me to, but it was going to be like four weeks postpartum. So that didn't happen, but I'm doing it. I'm I'm on the docket. I have to reach out to them again about um, doing this at our national uh, allergy and immunology fellowship program director meeting next year. That's fantastic. I think even the APTM program directors, the um, program directors in internal medicine, and I know PDF right. has a similar thing, yeah. would take this as a workshop. Um, and I agree with you, um, definitely you know, transferable to other programs um, in terms of the need to have that, that hands-on experience. Great practical. Yeah, thank feedback. you. That's great feedback. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Now it's time for cardiology. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tumalo, thanks for joining us today um, for your abstract entitled Challenging Advanced Learners Through a Protected Longitudinal Curriculum Innovations in Cardiology Fellowship Education. Thanks so much, Shanta. Um, so I'm Alexis Tumalo. Um, call me Lexi. I'm one of the um, cardiology fellowship associate program directors and also um, the same for the cardiac electrophysiology fellowship. Um, and my um, project that I'm presenting today is um, curricular innovation in our general cardiology fellowship. Um, and I thank all of my co-authors on this who are um, in, um, instrumental per, um, members of our department who are very uh, dedicated to education. Um, and basically this project stemmed from a desire to improve our cardiology fellowship. Um, and our department chair, Dr. Buttrick, was very supportive of us making um, multiple changes to our fellowship structure in order to meet learners' needs. Um, and we started with performing a very comprehensive, I'm gonna try to zoom while I move this around, here we go, um, a very comprehensive um, needs assessment through the use of um, of targeted anonymous interviews, um, which were conducted in um, the spring of 2020. Um, our hypothesis was that in our, um, in our fellowship, um, where there are a number of um, clinical needs for very sick people um, and a number of um, very specific skills that our fellows need to learn in their training, that um, the clinical demands can often interrupt our dedicated learning time um, for our fellows. Um, and this was corroborated through the structured um, anonymous interviews that we performed. 
Um, these, um, this report, and I wish I could share the whole thing with you guys, but it was, it's about 50 pages long, um, basically highlighted some themes um, in that clinical duties um, do interrupt our protected learning opportunities. And also there were deficits in faculty engagement and mentorship, uh, which were highlighted. Some of the quotes from the um, from the evaluation are here, um, that the educational goals of our program were not met because of the clinical work that interrupted this, um, and that not all of the faculty in the vision, division were dedicated to fellow education. Um, there is a consensus through these interviews that a longitudinal protected curriculum would be an optimal learning model um, with feedback that included that creating a systematic curriculum that goes throughout the year that everybody can attend would be very, very helpful helpful um, and additional ones just about structured curriculum, um, even if it's just a half day here and there um, would be very helpful our, for our fellows um, education. So this inspired the creation of protected academic days, which I'll abbreviate ADs um, just while I talk about it here. So the um, Objectives of our academic days, days were creating a cohesive longitudinal fellowship curriculum uh, with an emphasis on core learning topics, but also with integration of cardiac subspecialties um, and innovative um, research and new technologies to introduce our fellows to these areas. Um, we also wanted to incorporate hands-on teaching with simulation-based experiences and have all of this occur in a safe, safe learning environment that's highly engaging to help our fellows develop their intellectual curiosity um, and encourage them to connect with each other um, form relationships with other fellows and with our faculty who are participating in the days. Um, from previous literature um, reviews, there have been no um, studies on um, longitudinal curricula throughout cardiology fellowships, and this was a very um, kind of innovative model that we created. Um, so this goes through the themes of each of these academic days. Um, each of them are based in a disease process, um, but as I said, include multiple cardiac subspecialists in each day. Um, so there are about 20 topics total that we include in the session. This runs over the course of two years with some repetition of um, high yield topics, especially towards the beginning of the year, such as you know, ACS basics, that's acute coronary syndrome basics, um, atrial fibrillation or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, during these ADs, the fellows are completely excused from clinical responsibilities. In fact, their, their pagers are not listed on the AMION paging system and pages are sent directly to the attendings on service. Um, the content and structure of these days were deployed uh, determined by a large collaborative team, all of my co-authors from multiple cardiac subspecialties, um, with course faculty also selected by these people and kind of lead um, educators on each day. And these days include a spectrum of, of topics from basic science through um, you know, interventional procedures, um, humanism, humanism and professionalism, um, career development um, and have provided this wonderful plat a platform for innovative teaching um, with simulation based um, activities. Um, the data that we have received so far has been extremely positive. Um, we've conducted six ADs so far this year. Um, the 20 general fellows are required to attend um, and 11 subspecialty fellows are invited to attend as well. Um, following each AD, the fellows submit an evaluation on um, all of the speakers of the day, the content, um, were there, was their time protected during the day um, and how, how relevant, how clinically relevant relevant were the, um, were the teaching uh, topics of the day. Um, there is one part of this um, post-day uh, survey that we include was, um, and that's just its general question is, overall was today's session helpful for your learning and clin clinical care? Um, that's on a scale of one to 10, um, with scores ranging so far from four and a half for a basic and translational research day um, to 9.1 for an electrophysiology device day. Um, in general, the scores are quite high, seven, eight, nine, um, so far from our fellows who have completed the surveys. Um, in addition to this, 
the feedback that we've just gotten informally from fellows, um, either on the day or afterwards, has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, they cite the clinical relevance, the scope of the content. Um, they cite the engagement of the faculty and enthusiasm. But they also have brought up um, this sense of community that's created by these days, both among the fellows and with the faculty and their um, opportunities to create mentoring relationships, be um, introduced to research opportunities and really just get to know other people in the department. Um, and I just, I love this as an outcome. And this is something that I'm really excited to focus on more at the end of this first year, especially with focused questions on satisfaction and burnout to see how this inter Prevention affects that part of our fellowship as well. These are just a few quotes from the feedback so far um, on specific days that they're amazing, it's high yield, um, really well put together. Um, we've gotten a lot of great construction feedback, uh, constructive feedback as well, um, and have incorporated opportunities for fellows to just hang out with each other at the end of the day, um, which has been really wonderful for their sense of well being, especially during this time that has been stressful and isolating during the pandemic. Um, so in conclusion, so far, these academic days have created these wonderful new learning environments um, and, and platforms for people to connect with each other within our program. And we're really excited to look at other ways that it's um, impacting our program and just keep working on this work in progress. I'll take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Tumalo, for sharing that. I, I want to shout out to you that you didn't highlight it, but noted that the electrophysiology components were particularly positively valued um, repeatedly <laughs> um, in there. And I and I do like this other piece about the community building. And I think other fellowship training programs have experienced similar challenges of really needing to protect fellows' time. Do the faculty resent that time away from the clinical services at they, all, or is it? You know, the um, the first two I will say were a little bit more of learning experiences for us, and that we had to kind of create a system for, um, say, emergent procedures like um, central lines that needed to be placed and things like that. But that was just something that we implemented to support the faculty. Um, but we're really able to run the services without the fellows and. I think on the other hand, the fellows who have, I mean, sorry, the faculty who have been involved with the days have loved teaching them. And I think that overall the response has been really positive among the faculty too. Great. I think from a um, education perspective, in terms of what will be generalizable to be other programs, mm -hmm. will be to um, pull in your ACGME survey data pre yeah. and post, um, yeah. and be able to report that out. Especially as all of us are being required to talk about well-being and things mm -hmm. like that, using the diversity lens again. A, a little yeah. bit of a broken record here. Pulling that in if you're also talking about humanities and medicine to be thinking mm -hmm. about racial inequities. Um, yeah. and, and discrimination that might result in differences in outcomes in some of those modules will also help you from the ACGME status, but is also, yeah. you know, just good uh, for patient care too. Totally. Thank you, Shanta. Awesome work. Thanks, everybody. Um, our next presenter um, it, and her crew here is Vikasini Malingam, who's presenting to us uh, what happened and why curriculum responding to racism, discrimination, and microaggressions in the clinical learning environment. Thank you, Vikasini, for joining us and for your co-presenters as well. Of course. Um, so just wanted to mention that a bunch of co-presenters are here. And um, if anyone has additional sort of comments or details they want to throw in um, that I miss in the presentation, please feel free at the end. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm really excited about this curriculum that uh, I helped develop and that our team put together in response to essentially going through our third year clerkships in um, LICs and traditional models um, and sort of understanding that the original what happened and why curriculum could be sort of taken to another stage so that beyond just recognizing instances of racism, discrimination, and mistreatment on the campus or just in the world, that we could find a way to respond and essentially teach each other and learn from each other um, in a way that not only acknowledges our own vulnerabilities and fears with regard to um, actually responding to scary and sometimes inappropriate um, words, comments, um, and just experiences, but it, it 
it gives us uh, essentially an understanding of what we can do next and how to respond rather than just um, acknowledge. So um, I'll go ahead and just get started with some of the background that um, we included in our paper. So again, this was developed by students for students. And we had the distinct pleasure of being coached by Dr. Neumeier, who is on this call, um, and, and essentially just gaining her approval, guidance, advocacy, in terms of integrating this curriculum and um, ultimately making it a required session for preclinical students who, or I like to call them periclinical students, students who are, who are about to enter the clinical setting, um, but might benefit from being aware of how they can address RDM or racism, discrimination, and mistreatment prior to having to deal with it all of a sudden, something that uh, a lot of my co-authors and I uh, really would have valued. Um, so it started with a pilot training and actually we had the second phase of our um, training session this January. So we have two rounds of data that were collected. Essentially, the way that we put together this curriculum um, is uh, in tandem with a few other paradigms that already exist. So um, from Albert Einstein School of Medicine, um, Rhonda Achinolu, and then of course, Dr. Kimberly Manning um, from Emory. There, there have been various iterations of this um, 40s approach. Uh, it's essentially a mnemonic that uh, we had just revised to include two more Ds that we thought might allow students to have a little bit more breath in terms of how they respond, just based on how we feel we would candidly respond in um, more difficult situations. So the six Ds that we utilized were to direct, distract, delegate, defer, and display discomfort, um, as well as debrief. So those Ds uh, are essentially a map of different ways that a person can react or respond to racism, discrimination, and mistreatment. So we had a case-based uh, presentation to all of the students in um, both cohorts. And they were the, the sessions were formatted as small groups that had one to two facilitators who would first start out by just sort of defining terms, laying ground rules, then present the case. And each case would um, essentially terminate in the students being assigned a role. Um, and that would sort of encourage them to utilize one of the Ds that they may or may not be comfortable with. Um, and just sort of allowing them the chance to just visualize how that might actually happen. So an example um, was a student who was called one of the office girls by preceptor um, in a rural setting. And we present the case, then we have, let's say, five students to six students, um, each taking on a different type of role as either the bystander or the recipient of the said RDM. And um, we asked them to essentially role play how they would utilize one of those Ds to respond to that um, RDM. And we tried to create a room for essentially discussion around how uncomfortable it is to actually address some of these things and whether or not in the real world we would feel comfortable or safe um, actually making the claims that we quote unquote should in response to RDM if, if we think that these are actualizable and, and essentially operationalizable. So um, what we found uh, was that students really valued having uh, a rounded out knowledge of how to address RDM, but also understanding how these cases ended, just to know how the school responded, whether or not the, the students in these cases actually sort of received acknowledgement for what they went through. And the cases progressively became more and more sort of severe, starting with, um, you know, being called an office girl and kind of ending with uh, a, essentially use of the N-word uh, targeting a Black student in uh, the clinical setting during a clinical rotation. So we like to essentially create sort of a spectrum of different ways in which RDM can occur so that students could recognize when and, and what sort of constitutes RDM. Sometimes there are instances that feel so minor that students are like, oh yeah, this is just how things go. But um, what we really learned from this was that there was a significant improvement, not only in being able to identify microaggressions, but also just an awareness of 
response strategies that um, could be aimed at the medical team um, what, or when RDM is aimed at the medical team or the students themselves or patients. So we essentially had pre and post survey data that um, occurred on like a Likert scale. Um, we've just got a few of our most um, impressive um, and important sort of uh, data points here on this graph, but uh, there was a market and sort of significant increase in not only the comfort that students had addressing RDM, um, but in various different environments. So that's in the clinical environment, whether it's towards um, essentially racism, discrimination, mis mistreatment that's aimed towards themselves, aimed towards patients, and aimed towards other providers or their people on the care teams. And that is valuable just because there's uh, sort of a different internalization of how these um, kinds of mistreatment experiences happen uh, when they're aimed at different people. Um, and we found that applying communication skills to deal with RDM was also a significant point of improvement that students had after um, receiving this training, which was really the entire goal of this project um, to try and get people prepared ahead of time to comfortably and or at least somewhat comfortably address RDM um, when aimed at anyone in the team. Um, and finally, we found that there was an increased comfort in addressing RDM that was perpetuated by the individual themselves. Um, and that was our most profound data point there where um, people could essentially self-reflect. And that is absolutely something that I didn't anticipate coming out of this work, but that will allow students to essentially sustainably maintain this awareness and, and these kinds of strategies. So um, this is just a broader effort to confront patterns of racism and discrimination that constantly impact medicine. Um, and the most exciting aspect of this is just that it's gonna be included in curriculum henceforth. And that's again, thanks to Dr. Neumeyer, um, as well as Dr. Lee, um, just for essentially including us as students in the process of, of developing curriculum. That's something that CU does exceptionally well and that um, we're just really excited to be a part of. So um, yeah, we're planning to longitudinally evaluate this curriculum effectiveness and um, it, it has demonstrated itself as a valuable and integral part of preparing students for the clinical environment. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Vikasni, and also to all of your teammates. Um, and I know you know that this curriculum was built upon the what happened and why that started in the first course in 2017. Um, and so there's been really a lot of um, overwhelming support for developing and revising this curriculum. What um, aspect of, you know, sort of resources outside of your own, their own upstander behaviors, uh, do you include as part of the curriculum? So sort of like, what do you do? Where do you go besides knowing what to say or knowing who to turn to? What do you, where do you, what do you do for that? Exactly. Yeah. And was that a question for me? Or? Yeah. So what part of the curriculum, what of, <laughs> you know, training people to be more comfortable being upstanders is really important, but then the reporting mechanism that allows closure at the institutional level, whether that's the clinical environment or the medical school is also super important so that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> totally. And we actually built like a whole uh, a document that details different resources. That's something that we found in the second iteration of this course that students really wanted to know who to go to. And what we found is that CU offers multiple avenues. So essentially there's a degree of comfort that students might have with a clinical advisor or the clerkship director or um, essentially like an ACP or compass guide uh, mentor type of figure. But there's many avenues by which students can report. And um, we sort of just charted it all out and allowed students to see where uh, where where they can really take the information and not whether or not they want to report is sort of still in their court, but there's um, still ways to obtain acknowledgement for issues that may or may not pertain to RDM or might. So um, that that was pretty exciting. Great. And Dr. Rodriguez, you had a question. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, everybody who's presented today. These have been fantastic. <clears throat> and um, I just had a question um, for you about how long your session is. And if, is it just one session or do you, did you develop a series of, 
of these types of um, uh, sessions, I guess. Totally, yeah. So it's designed to be one session that occurs mm -hmm. during um, the integrated uh, clinical curriculum. Uh -huh. I, that's what ICC stands for. I'm not completely sure. Um, but that uh, is... It's, it's only one iteration of the course, uh -huh. but it happens successively through co cohorts. So um, Dr. Neumeyer has actually been working on maybe um, extending this into the fourth year curriculum as well. So that means each cohort would get three what happened and why um, exposures. And how long are each session? Four hours, I believe. Four or hours. is it three hours? I'm trying to remember. I think our pilot was three. Okay. Okay, and I, I have more questions, but I'll follow up with you and Dr. Niemeyer outside of this, but thank you so much for your work. Thanks. Awesome, great. Any other, there's a comment in the chat you should see from Dr. Magnuson. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's important for students, staff, and faculty to have opportunities to practice addressing RDMs. Um, thanks again. So yeah, awesome work. Lexi, did you have a question too? No, okay. Well, I wanna um, echo Jenny's thanks to all of you and congratulations to everyone and your co-authors for this fantastic um, discussion and session today. Uh, thanks again to Jody Wang for her support in organizing all of our efforts. Um, please, oh, go ahead, Jody. We still have one more presenter. Okay. Um, you probably, oh. okay, it's Dr. Yeah. Sorry, right, Dr. Weintraub, I didn't have you on my <laughs> list, but I'm excited. Um, implementation of a longitudinal dermatology curriculum in internal medicine residency education. Go for it. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to take myself off of... Um, Camera. Uh, can we can hear you well and we see your poster well too, thanks. Okay, all right. Um, so my name is Gil Weintraub. Sorry I'm late, uh, just finishing up dermatology clinic. Um, so. Uh, I am a, I, I spent my time at the VA uh, and at the, the university, and uh, I had the good pleasure of working with um, some of the internal medicine faculty there, and there was a lot of demand for people to learn about things on their skin, and we had thought long and hard about uh, how do we integrate this in the curriculum, or do we simply just provide lectures as we normally would in the morning or at lunchtime, and did some digging, and this kind of shocking, uh, but there's not a lot of dermatologists around. In fact, there's a real dearth of dermatologists. And the majority of dermatologic care actually isn't provided by dermatologists, which to me screams that we need to make sure that we're doing a good job teaching our medical students and certainly teaching primary care, uh, as well as across specialties, uh, people that identify uh, simple dermatologic diseases as well as scary ones, uh, with the expectation that you know, they're gonna be able to deliver care not only for their patients, but for their really uh, concerned family members too. So, uh, with this in mind, we wanted to meet with stakeholders. So we met with the chief residents who provide and lead a lot of the didactics, as well as the faculty members, predominantly those at the VA, uh, to think about what would be a good form of teaching, what would be a high yield way of delivering education uh, or material. And universally, it said that um, attention spans are low, time is low, um, and we need to make sure we, we fit it in a space where people have uh, opportunities to consume this information. So we came up with the idea of seven minute modules, five to seven minutes, pre-made, pre-chewed, pre-masticated. All you have to do is put it up on the screen. And the goal is to do it before uh, lunchtime lectures that chief residents would normally give. And the, the idea would be to teach things that would be relevant on the inpatient and outpatient side. Uh, and the, the PowerPoints would be made for, for lectures. And so there'd be notes about how to deliver it, questions to ask, pearls to acknowledge. Uh, and they could simply uh, flip through the screen. And so you notice in the center of the poster, there's a presentation board that starts with a 65-year-old uh, female with history of hypertension, sun exposure, uh, presents with a history of peripheral rash. And as you scroll, there's a question and then leads to those answers, and you can see the answers there. And the idea is just the high-yield nuggets that people could acquire in a short amount of time. Um, additionally, we wanted to see, you know, are we actually doing a good job in helping people retain information? So we, we uh, developed two 20-question uh, tests. Uh, in NBME standard format uh, that we mixed up. Uh, some people received the test in the, the test A in the beginning, and some people developed test B as their pretest, and, the, and vice versa on the backside. And the plan was to deliver that in July and August, and then deliver the curriculum throughout the year, and then test it at the end and see how we did. Uh, it's really hard to get house staff to take tests, and so we tried to sweeten the deal by giving them exam uh, giving them uh, gift cards. 
Uh, and the more they, they did, the better they, the more gift cards they would receive. Uh, so we were doing this in pairing with a longitudinal curriculum for reading x-rays, uh, point of care ultrasounds, as well as EKGs. We, despite our best efforts, did not have a great showing of residents taking the test. Um, and then when we tried to convince, or we had already agreed that the chief residents were gonna deliver these pre-made, uh, pre-templated lectures, um, it turned out that in the, in the fall, not only was COVID very busy and active for our internal medicine resident friends, but also many of the chief residents are actually interviewing for their fellowships. So the people meant to deliver the lectures and the people meant to receive the lectures. Neither of them were really available or really in the end interested in receiving any of the curriculum. Uh, now it's true for dermatology, although a couple, I think, of the EKG and ultrasound ones actually did end up like getting delivered. So it was a really big um, uh, a learning point. Uh, and so with less than half the residents actually participating in the pretest and none of them receiving it in the formal way, the, the small group lectures, um, you know, it, it was not very effective uh, as a curricular intervention or limited at best. Uh, and so our goal was to lower the barrier for, for teaching dermatology, um, but we really realized that you need protected time, and there's a limited amount of time you can expect learners to, to be present for, uh, no matter how low the bar, the bar you think is. And so we had a post-mortem discussion with, uh, with stakeholders, again, both faculty and chief residents, and realized what the demand was for was not more lectures squeezed into less the same amount of time, which makes sense. Uh, it was simply to, to offload chief residents. And so we know there's a season when they're looking for fellowships and what their future will hold beyond. And so we offered to create the, the, the lectures during that time period when the stress is the highest. And so we've um, modified our curriculum and are currently doing this to have a series of these small, short lectures uh, amalgamated together in relevant um, themes. Uh, that'll be spiralized across the year as they receive them. Uh, and it'll be so the chief residents don't have to develop any, any curriculum and, and it'll replace the normal lunchtime lectures that they receive. Uh, and in that way, I think it aligns with the goals of keeping time protected uh, and making sure we're adding value for residents um, in a way that they feel is, is useful. Um, we still are in conversations with the IM team about delivering the questions at the end, still the test, just to see uh, throughout the year in normal curriculum, what type of education people receive. And we can then cross standard, we can compare that to when the intervention is actually delivered in a meaningful way. And that can be a nice kind of natural study for it, but we shall see. Anyway, I wanted to thank everyone for taking your time. Um, it was nice to be able to present and work on this project. Great. Thanks, Dr. Weintraub. I, one of the questions I had, um, and I see Dr. Fein, uh, Fein said was a co-author on your project is whether or not you use the IM Teach platform uh, for developing the modules. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So okay. Brandon said is a very smart guy who's very industrious, and he kept knocking on our door and said, we got to do this, we got to do this. And eventually he convinced us. And he's done that across a lot of specialties. Uh, and so it's been really fun to, to work with him. And so we've been uploading this onto Teach I Am, um, and we've been trying to roll it out through that platform uh, within our residency programs here. And then ideally um, throughout other programs as well, once we can actually have a kind of a proof of concept. Great. I think that um, was we, I know you were in clinic, but we had a presentation from Dr. Melton earlier today about using that in the outpatient setting. And I wonder if some of these modules might have a little bit more stickiness um, for our residents in their preclinical, um, their preclinic um, time when they're um, kind of doing just in time learning around that. And you have more people who are doing the peer to peer teaching besides just the chief residents. So that might be another space. Um, and then as an That'd be wonderful. Yeah. I, I think I, you know, I can connect you with Mara and um, Dr. Sacro, who's the program director for the um, for the um, primary care track. The other place I think about it, wearing my infectious disease hat, is like our ID fellows could use this kind of thing too. Um, nobody is great at the skin, and sometimes tends to give it to you um, dermatologists um, instead of really trying to learn these things themselves. So um, maybe another collaboration there. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. Um, I really appreciate kind of any connections that you have. I think we've been using, we've been leaning on Brandon pretty hard, but I think having other opportunities with other people might be a nice way to, to help integrate the curriculum. And if there are particular people with particular interests, so, you know, we're happy to cook things up that are ID specific or otherwise. Great. Thank you again so much. And thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks, Jody, uh, for the reminder. I sorry, I almost cut you off there. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zimmer. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jody. You're welcome. Thank you.